video three of chapter two, we are going to turn our attention now uh, from things like percentiles and z-scores and linear transformations into density curves and specifically the normal distribution. So first off, what is a density curve? A density curve is a graph that helps approximate the shape of a distribution. So if you look in the background here, you'll see a histogram. And I know it's a histogram and not a bar graph because there are no spaces between these bins or boxes. Uh, but the red curve that I have applied here represents a density curve. You're just kind of approximating with a rough sketch curve here what shape that histogram would represent. Now you'll notice that I didn't have my curve go all the way up to the top and really hit the top of every bin here. Um, but you're just trying to roughly outline what this thing looks like. And I know I'll have students that will say, well, this obviously goes up and then it comes down and then it goes back up and then it comes back down and then it comes back up. So that is a trimodal distribution. There's three peaks to it. Or some students will say that it at least has one, two, and then they'll kind of fudge on the rest of this, and they'll say this is a bimodal distribution, which I wouldn't necessarily argue against, but clearly this is more just kind of following along, if you will, a skewed right distribution altogether. I wouldn't get real nitpicky with, you know, how many hills and valleys and uh, that you're really going all together. I'd need to see something clearly where you had a lot of data, and then there was a clear lull and then more data before I would call it bimodal. So two properties, one of them much more important than the other, uh, but the most important property that I would say here is that density curves always have an area underneath the curve of one or 100%. It's where 100% of our data is located. Uh, and then technically, this is true, that the density curve is strictly above the x-axis. So we're only going to have positive y values, if you will. Uh, so if you consider any kind of distribution, it can't have a negative quantity. If we think of the uh, vertical axis or the y-axis as quantity, we cannot have negative quantity. So this can't be down here. It would just strictly have to stop there at the x-axis. But this is definitely the main property to know about all density curves. Any shape distribution always has 1 or 100% underneath its curve in terms of area. So for the uniform, uniform, uniform density curve, which means a kind of a flattened distribution here, um, what is the probability value for this question mark? So whatever context the problem is, that's what your x-axis is going to be. And then the probabilities associated with each of those values is going to be our vertical axis. Okay, so instead of quantity, you can kind of think of it as how likely is that event to occur. Now, I can see here that really in my uniform density curve, I have a rectangle. And the area of this rectangle, if you think back to your geometry days, is just base times height, right? And the base has a length of 5. So I got to figure out what the height is, which would be my question mark value, but one of the properties of a density curve was the area had to be 1 or 100%. So if I solve this algebraically and divide the 5 over, then question mark is equal to 1 fifth, which is 0 0.2 or 20%. So any of those three values is technically what goes over here. So again, the area has always got to be 1. If you know one of the pieces to get the area, then you can algebraically solve for the other piece. So now I put in my point 0.2 into here, and now I'm asking, what are the mean and the median? And the mean and median, well, the median is the um, spot that splits up our density curve into equal areas, 50-50. Uh, and the mean is really the balancing point, if we thought about this as density. Um, and in this case, they both end up being the same value, which would be what's in between 0 and 5 would be 2.5. So the median and mean both have a value of 2.5. Um, and again, if you think of there's 50% area underneath a value of 2.5, that means that a value of 2.5 is in the 50th percentile. Now, what is the probability of selecting the median value of 
So if I got 2.5 right here, and I want to know what's the probability of selecting basically 2.5 between 0 and 5. Now the first question you might ask is, well, obviously we're not talking about whole number values here. If we have the median, that's a decimal value. But do we only include decimal values to the nearest tenth? Or could we do to the nearest hundredth or thousandth or ten thousandth? How many decimal places can we really go from 0 to 5? And to be honest with you, there are infinitely many values between 0 and 5 because it doesn't specify how many decimal places this density curve uh, is made up of. So if you really think about it here, what is the probability of selecting one number out of infinitely many numbers? Well, really, that's kind of zero, and I'll put on here, it's zero-ish. It's not really zero, but it's a number so close to zero that it's essentially zero. So that would be true for any such value between 0 and 5. But what would happen if you took all those 1 out of infinities and added them all together? Then you would get 100% of your density curve, which seems a little weird, right? You have all these little 0 ishes, but all those 0 ishes added together add up to be 1. So now you're going to see, if we can't really do probability of single values, then what can we do probability of? And here's where we're going to start kind of containing value. So if this represent, if this was two and a half, so let's say two is here, three is here, four is here, one is here. So let's say if we just look at the whole number values. And now I want to know what's the probability of selecting a value between one, so let me take one and go all the way up to the top of my density curve, and four. So I want to know what's the probability that you're in this particular region, which is just a smaller rectangle. Now, we know the probability of being anywhere between 0 and 5 is 100%, so this answer is going to be smaller than 100%, but you still want to think about this in terms of area. Now, instead of the base being the full 5, now the base is the difference between 1 and 4, which is 3. And what's the height of this rectangle? It's still technically our point 2, since it has a uniform uh, curve to it. So the area of this rectangle would be 3 times point 2, which is... 0.6 or 60 percent. So 60 percent of all values are between 1 and 4. And we could say the other 20 percent is between 0 and 1, and the other 20 percent is between 4 and 5. And so 20, 20, and 60, again, there would be all 100 percent. So you have to specifically find the probability between specific numbers in your distribution. Otherwise, the probability of selecting one singular value is essentially zero. So now what I would like you guys to try, and we'll discuss this tomorrow in class, is what is the probability of selecting a value between 0.68 and 3.36? So again, you can just kind of approximate. We'll say, I don't know, here's where 0.68 is, and uh, I don't know, somewhere up here, here's where 3.36 is. And so now what's the area of that rectangle? So I'll let you guys try that one. And if you want to pause the video so that you can work on it, do that now and then you can resume the video so that we can see about normal distributions. So the normal distribution is a type of density curve. It is a specific type of density curve that is unimodal. It has one peak. Uh, it is bell-shaped, and it is symmetric, which is a very, very nice feature that we will use in this video. Now, what is the area underneath the bell-shaped normal curve? It's still one. But now this is where it's going to get a little bit different because now we need to find areas under curves. So if I said, what's the area between here and here? Basically, you would have to use some calculus to be able to figure that out, which we're not going to do calculus. You're welcome. Uh, but that's really the main idea or really the background work of figuring out percentages um, or area in normal distributions. So, normal distribution has a mean in the middle, which not only is the middle the mean, but it's also technically the median, because it splits up our normal curve to 50 and 50% 50 on either side of it. And technically, the center is also the mode. So, all three measures of center, mean, median, mode, just happen to be this middle value. And if we're going to use mean, we're going to use standard deviation. 
Now, typically, you'll see pictures like this that'll show you three standard deviations below the mean and three standard deviations above the mean. But here's the main thing I want you to all understand about how many standard deviations can you really go above and below the mean? And the theoretical answer is infinitely many. Now, it becomes increasingly rare and rare and rare of event to be so many standard deviations away from the mean. But technically, this curve doesn't just stop right here. It keeps going on and on and on. And that little tail area, you can see beyond the three standard deviations up here, there's not a whole lot of area up here. There's just not going to be very many values beyond three standard deviations, either above or below the mean. So even though it looks like this thing flattens out and there's no area, still theoretically this thing keeps going on and on and on. So there are technically infinitely many normal distributions because the mean can take on infinitely many values. Likewise, our standard deviation could have infinitely many values as well. However, there is a particular kind of normal distribution called the standard normal distribution, which relates to something that we talked about back in video one. So I could have a normal distribution that has a mean of 1010 and uh, what's the standard deviation set up here? S20. Um, and so this could be some sort of context, like maybe SAT scores or whatever the case may be, whatever these values represent. Uh, but we did an example in a previous video where we tried to compare uh, my SAT score to my ACT score. And we said that was like comparing apples to oranges, and we couldn't do it. So we had to standardize our scores and turn them into Z scores. Well, a standard normal distribution has values that are z-scores. So if you're at a uh, positive one z-score, that literally means you're one standard deviation above the mean. And if you have a z-score of negative three, that literally means you're three standard deviations below the mean of zero. Okay, so again, there's only one standard normal distribution. And again, it has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one but you could have infinitely many different normal distributions with any mean and any standard deviation. So our z-scores, again, this is what I was telling you about from earlier. Um, our z-scores represent how many standard deviations a value is away from the mean. So if we ever want to use z-scores, then we're gonna have to use that concept. So now here's the main thing that's kind of cool about normal distributions. I mentioned earlier that finding the area between certain regions on a normal curve would require calculus technically. Um, but there are some approximations that have been given to us, and it's called the 6895-997 rule, or it's also called the empirical rule. And here's how it works. And it kind of works not only on a standard normal curve, I mean, it's really seen on a standard normal curve, but it really applies to any normal distribution. Again, it applies to any normal distribution. So what it says is that if you were to go one standard deviation above and below the mean, which is a mean of zero here on our standard normal curve, then approximately 68% of all values are within one standard deviation of the mean. If we were to go out two standard deviations from the mean, one, two below and one, two above, then that represents approximately 95% of all of the data. And if we were to go out three standard deviations below the mean or above the mean, then that represents 99.7%. Now notice we didn't really talk about four standard deviations, but we could go out a fourth. But if three standard deviations above and below the mean already really contains 99.7% of the area, well, a fourth standard deviation can't add that much more if we're only 0.3% away from having 100%. So when you add more and more standard deviations below and above three, you're only adding a very, very small area to that. So usually three standard deviations covers most of what we need to consider there, okay? Um, in terms of work, you can call this the 6895-997 rule, or you can refer to it as the empirical rule. Both are accepted on the AP exam. So let's try some problems here with the empirical rule. 
It says, assume scores on the new SAT follow an approximately normal distribution with mean 1,000. So notice in the middle here, here's my mean of 1,000 and a standard deviation of 200. So notice I went ahead and did one, two, and three standard deviations above the mean and one, two, three standard deviations below the mean. And I've already got my 68, 95, 99, 7 already kind of nicely in place. Now you don't have to set every problem up like this, but it makes the empirical rule pop out. So the question is, what percent of scores are between 600 and 1400? So here's 600, here's 1400. Well, 600 was two standard deviations below, and 1400 was two standard deviations above. So that means the percent of scores that are between 600 and 1400 is approximately 95%. Now, one thing I haven't mentioned is whenever I put these approximate symbols in here, the answer isn't really exactly 95%, is within two standard deviations, but it's really close to 95%. So just know, when we get to video four in the next video, we're going to come up with a way to get the more exact answer, and not necessarily an approximate answer. But the approximate and the exact answers are both considered correct on the AP exam. Okay. Problem two, what percent of scores are above 1,400? So here's 1,400, here's above 1,400, and we didn't say where to stop. So this thing technically keeps on going and going and going, theoretically. Now, realistically, the SAT scores stop at 1,600, but we're going to theoretically describe this as going all the way up to positive infinity in this direction. So we got to figure out how much area is there beyond this. So what I would have you consider first is, well, that 1,400 was two standard deviations above. And if I went two standard deviations below, this represented 95%, right? 95% in the middle here, which means how much room is left outside of the 95%. And that would mean that this lower tail and this upper tail must contain the remaining 5% of the area. And since it's nice that the normal distribution is symmetric, then that must mean these two tail areas are exactly the same, since the 600 and the 1400 are both exactly two standard deviations away from the mean. So that means in this little tail area, there's 2.5% of area, and in this little tail up here is the other 2.5%. So again, 2.5 up here, 2.5 down here makes 5%, plus the 95% in between makes our full 100%. So the answer that I would be looking for is what percent is above 1,400? 2.5% approximately. All right, next problem. What about between 600 and 1,600? So now if you notice, we're going two standard deviations below and not two above, but three standard deviations above. Ooh, tricky. So there's quite a few different ways we could kind of approach this problem here. We know the answer is going to be at least 95%, because if we went from 1,600 up to 1,400, there's 95%. Now, could we figure out how much additional is between two and three standard deviations? Sure. How could we do that? Well, we could take the 99.7%, that's within three standard deviations, subtract out the middle 95%, which means we have 4.7% that is both below two standard deviations and above two standard deviations. But technically, it keeps going. Oh, no, no, wait. My bad. I said that incorrectly. The 4.7 represents what's between two and three on both ends. That's what I meant to say. Sorry for that. So this 4.7 represents this area and this area, and since this is a symmetric distribution, we could divide it into two equal parts. So each one of these little pieces represents 2.35%. So now to get from 600 to 1600, we could say, well, there's the middle 95% for the two standard deviations, plus an extra 2.35 between the two and the three standard deviations. So 95 plus 2.35 makes 
Now, we also could have figured out, well, how much area is there kind of from 600 below to negative infinity, and how much is there above three standard deviations, and we could have subtracted out those two regions from the whole 100%, and that would still leave us with 97.35%. Next problem. Uh, percent of scores between 1,000 and 1,100. So 1,100 isn't even a whole standard deviation above the mean. It's really what? Half a standard deviation. Now, this is what I'll have students do. They'll say, well, look, if it's 68% going one standard deviation above and below the mean, then symmetrically that means one standard deviation below has 34%, and one standard deviation above is the other 34% to get that total 68%, right? I mean, that makes sense symmetrically, 68% split up. And so if this is really 34%, do it, hold on, hold on, hold on. There we go. If this is 34% right here, then since 1100 is halfway between 1000 and 1200, then that would mean this represents 17%, half of 34. However, if this is 17%, that means this has to be 17%. And if you look at these two regions, do they truly look like they contain the same amount of area? And you can tell this one has less area because it doesn't have as a high of a uh, probability of occurring. So how do you do this problem if you can't simply just take half of 34? Well, that's what we're going to talk about in video four. So I'm just giving you a little preview there. So how can you answer this problem right now? You can't. So now what I want you guys to try is the last problem here. What percent of scores are below 1,200? So here's 1,200, which was exactly one standard deviation above the mean. And so I want you to go all the way. I don't want to go that far. I'll highlight everything underneath the curve. We want to go all the way from 1,200 down, and again, kind of theoretically, all the way down to negative infinity, even though truly it doesn't go all the way down to negative infinity. You would think that it would really stop at zero as a score, but we're just going to consider all the way down to negative infinity. So you can either find the area of this, and that's the answer I'm really looking for, or you could figure out how much area is greater than 1,200, and you could subtract it from 100%. Uh, but I'll kind of leave it up to you guys how you want to tackle this problem. So that is all for video three.